just to... Well, hello everybody. Welcome to a webinar on climate accountability litigation by governments against fossil fuel companies. Um, this is part one of a four part webinar series. And the topic today is crossing the threshold, challenges, opportunities, and legal theories. My name is Stephen Wood. I am the director of the Center for Law and the Environment at the Allard School of Law in UBC. And uh, this uh, webinar series is uh, brought to you jointly by um, the Center for Law and the Environment, uh, West Coast Environmental Law, the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria and the Faculty of Law at Thompson Rivers University. Uh, we welcome you and uh, I am going to uh, just show you one other poster, pardon for the little uh, glitch there, but I wanted to let folks know that um, the next webinar in this series uh, will be this coming Monday, November 9th, 12 p.m. Pacific time, and it is on the topic of connecting the dots, um, attribution and quantification of climate harms. And the webinar is being recorded and it will be archived for future reference. At this point, I will step out of the limelight and hand over to our moderator and host for today, Professor Chris Tollefson of the University of Victoria Faculty of Law. So over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to have been asked to moderate and I'll be contributing as well to today's uh, webinar. We thank all of you for joining us. I think we have a very healthy a large uh, group of folks uh, who've signed up. We look forward to uh, having a good session. Um, as Stefan has said, this is the first of a four-part webinar series. Uh, this first webinar is hosted by the University of Victoria, and as such, I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose territory uh, uh, University of Victoria is situated, as well as the Songhees of Squimal and Wasainik uh, peoples whose historical relationships with this territory continue to this day. Um, as Stepan has indicated, the topic of this webinar uh, is crossing the threshold, challenges, opportunities, and legal theories. Um, the structure of the session is as follows. We're going to start with a presentation by Corey Yakaluk. Uh, Corey is a senior Seattle-based litigator who has litigated on behalf of individuals and communities against large corporate defendants in a range of settings. Currently, she's part of a team that's representing public entities in fossil fuel litigation. Um, she is going to provide an overview and an update. And I've seen her PowerPoint, it's quite impressive. Uh, overview and update of the uh, a bewilderingly complex American scene when it comes to uh, litigation of this type. Um, after each speaker, by the way, we'll, we'll offer an opportunity for some interaction through the Q&A function. Don't use the chat, use the Q&A. Uh, I will be looking at that and, and directing questions as appropriate. So after each speaker, we'll take a couple of questions uh, mainly aim to clarify uh, the presentation. Uh, we'll try to get through all of the speakers in time that there'll be plenty of opportunity for Q&A at the end. Um, our second presenter is uh, Joseph Arve QC. He is uh, one of Canada's most experienced uh, constitutional litigators. Uh, anyone who's taken Con Law 100 has probably read at least a dozen of his cases. Uh, I recently co-counseled with him at, uh, on the LaRose case, which I think Joe uh, may uh, have something to say about today. I will. <laughs> uh, and Joe's uh, role here is mainly to offer some initial views about the potential for this kind of litigation here in Canada, uh, as well as I, I think 
on uh, the challenges associated with litigating around the climate uh, issue generally. Um, I will take up the third spot. My uh, topic is a bit more narrow and nerdy. My topic has to do with the justiciability of uh, climate cases. In particular, the doctrine of justiciability in the US, it's called the political questions doctrine and how it may apply and, and how it may be raised by defendants in this kind of litigation. And then finally, and quite appropriately, Professor Linda Collins from University of Ottawa uh, will be uh, uh, trying to sort of tie the threads together, offer some concluding comments that provide a bit of a platform for a discussion of the issues. And Linda is one of uh, our top thinkers when it comes to environmental rights, toxic tort litigation. And I certainly, again, uh, anyone who studies environmental law has, has, certainly, has certainly read her work. So as I say, we're gonna uh, uh, lead off with Corey. Uh, the presentations will vary in length and style. Uh, and at the, as, I, as I said, at the end of each one, uh, we'll press pause and give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Um, I don't know if I've missed anything else. I noticed Andrew Gage has just joined us and I wanted to shout out to Andrew Gage at West Coast Environmental Law, who is the person who's brainchild this uh, series. Uh, thank you uh, for that, Andrew. I uh, uh, wanted to just uh, recognize Andrew's role in making this happen. And with that, uh, I would like to pass the floor over to Corey Yakluk. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Can, can everyone hear me? My first question. Okay, <laughs> this is, um, you know, it's, it's our new reality, but it's so, it's so strange to not be able to see you and to um, do my usual thing, which would be to ask, you know, who you are and a little bit about who I'm speaking with. Um, but I'll just take it on faith that the questions will um, help all of us clarify what we're talking about. Um, I am of counsel to the Share Edling Law Firm, which represents the majority of the public entities in the US who have sued the fossil fuel industry for climate damages. Um, I also have my own practice in Seattle, Washington, um, product liability, medical malpractice, environmental torts. And I've known Vic Scher since um, I was a baby lawyer in the 1980s and we, <laughs> we've come full circle. Um, okay, I have given a version of the talk I'm about to give um, on two prior occasions. The first one in Saipan in January um, and I'm going to truncate it quite a bit um, in the interest of time. Um, and I'm still, if I'm going over, will somebody give me a, a signal? Okay. All right. Um, can, can everyone see? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay. Um, at present, the, and already this particular slide is outdated, there are, um, th this is an almost complete list of all of the public entities who have filed suit in the United States against the fossil fuel industry for climate damages. There are six states, um, including the District of Columbia, and at this point there are 16 cities and counties. Um, the first cases were filed in August of 2017. Um, by three California cities and counties. I know this slide looks incredibly busy, um, <laughs> and it is, but um, I'm gonna walk through it just quickly. On the far left, left column is the, um, are the plaintiffs around the country who have brought these cases. The, the green ones are, are share Edling clients, but it, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the next column is the defendants, and. I think the point of this, one of the points of this chart is that these cases are not cookie cutters. Each, um, the cases do not all name the same defendants. They do not all plead the same types of damages and the causes of action are not identical. So um, I just wanna point out a couple things about the defendants. The states of Massachusetts and Connecticut, which are represented by their own attorney general's offices have sued only Exxon and only on um, 
consumer fraud kinds of claims. Um, the state of Massachusetts has been at it for years. They tried to get documents in a pre-filing procedure and were unable to, and they finally just filed suit, um, and they are off and running. Um, in terms of um, impacts, again, these are, not, these are not monolithic. The District of Columbia, I'll point out, has, filed, has included only a consumer protection claim, and so its damages are, are harms to consumers for spending money on products that they didn't know were going to destroy the environment. Um, you know, Minnesota doesn't have a sea level rise claim for obvious reasons. Um, and in terms of legal claims asserted, um, again, I think this is important to see that, that there is quite a range of claims that have been asserted and they are not the same. The industry likes to refer to these cases as nuisance cases. It's a play on words. They are, um, the, you know, the point is, their, their point is and their talking points that these cases are annoying and they're pointless and they're a nuisance. One of the legal theories, one of the tort theories is, of course, public nuisance. But it is not the only theory and in some cases it has not even been pleaded. At the end of the day, all of the theories are based on the concept of deception, deceptive conduct. This, this type of conduct has been found to be actionable in a number of different contexts that um, I actually don't know if all of this has happened in Canada, but for example, in the lead paint context, in water contamination, MTBE, a gasoline additive, opioids, guns, and tobacco, where corporate conduct um, was at issue and it was uh, um, an effort to deceive the public about known dangers internally while pr actively promoting and marketing and, and making uh, tremendous amounts of profit off of these dangerous products. The courts so far in all of our cases have got it. They have not, they have, they have resisted the defense that these are nuisance cases or that these are cases, and this goes to what Chris is going to be talking about, that these are cases where the, the clients are really trying to regulate climate policy or trying to regulate carbon emissions. That is not what these tort claims are doing or are intended to do. And, um, and the judges across the country in our cases have rejected that attempt by the defense to reframe our claims into something that they are not. I have pulled two quotes out from two of the, um, two of the decisions. I'm not gonna read these in the interest of time, but I have the citations here. And they're, and they're wonderful if you're reading while listening. Um, I have added, since the last time I gave this talk in red, I have added some more recent history to these decisions and it just sort of shows you how dynamic this litigation is right now. Um, the Baltimore case, this first one, the United States Supreme Court on October 2nd has agreed to accept review of a very, very narrow procedural issue. Um, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. So that's where the cert granted comes from. In the Rhode Island case, the first circuit, which is our federal appeals court level, just last week, last Thursday, affirmed the federal trial court's decision that the cases belong in state court, not in federal court. Um, and, and actually that has been where the fight has been so far, is we file the cases in state court, the defendants automatically remove them to federal court, which in the US they're allowed to do simply by filing a removal notice. They don't have to get permission to do it, they just do it. And then a, a, a very protracted fight has ensued over which jurisdiction is the correct jurisdiction and so far we have won every one of those. So we have four federal appeals court panels saying 
these cases belong in state court. And that is the issue that the United States Supreme Court has taken review of. And it's even narrower than that, and I'm not gonna go into it. Um, if you really wanna read, if you wanna read a really entertaining app appellate court decision, <laughs> um, read this First Circuit decision in the state of Rhode Island from last Thursday. It's full of plays on words. It is fun. Um, and it is, you know, it is rigorous, but I, I really don't know that I've ever seen anything like it. The judges had, had a great time doing it. An interesting other little aside, one of the three panelists who heard the argument died two days before this, this opinion issued. And um, he was a, a great jurist, had been on the court since um, the Reagan years. He was in his late 80s, and I think it was unexpected. And um, we were concerned about what would happen, and I think the opinion had already been written, fortunately. Um, all right, so um, that's a little bit about the state of play in the litigation. I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, just a, a, a little bit of information about the factual background um, for the, the claims about this deception campaign. Um, first of all, you know, it is beyond dispute that the majority of the CO2 emissions that are driving climate change are human caused. Um, and the other thing that is really beyond dispute at this point is that the industry has known about the connection between their own, um, about, between carbon emissions, global mean temperatures, and environmental destruction, and, and you know, perhaps, <laughs> Um, political upheaval and economic upheaval and, and all the rest. Um, this is a 1965 report by the president of the American Petroleum Institute, um, 1965, noting one of the most important predictions of a report that had come out of the Johnson administration actually, is that carbon dioxide is being added to the Earth's atmosphere by the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas at such a rate that by the year 2000, the heat balance will be so modified as possibly to cause market changes in climate beyond even national efforts. Um, API and the industry actually began to privately fund research to better understand this phenomenon um, that they recognized. And um, one of the, the first report, the 1968 Stanford Research Institute report, confirmed um, this evidence and, and really sounded the alarm further. Um, you know, the year 2000 was noted as an as a important year. There seems to be no doubt that the potential damage to our environment could be severe. So the next paragraph is interesting because it recognizes that the science on this is pretty settled. The only thing that is lacking is work towards systems in which CO2 emissions would be brought under control. This is 68. ExxonMobil um, funded very good science internally for years. 19, this is a 1978 report from one of the climate scientists in Exxon to the Exxon Corporate Management Committee, so educating the, the highest levels of the company about the risk. Um, and, you know, he says there is general scientific agreement. And I just remember those words because <laughs> I'm going to come back to, to that. Man has a window of five to 10 years before the need for hard decisions regarding changes in energy strategies might become critical. And I, I guess every time I, I read this, I'm, um, I'm both shocked and sort of heartbroken to think that um, this was so well understood and we are, um, and, you know, nothing not only nothing happened, but we continue to burn fossil fuels at an ever increasing rate. Um, more excerpts from more Exxon reports, internal reports. These were not shared publicly. Um, this one is in this slide is interesting um, in part because of this graph. This is um, sh it shows the tight connection that they recognize between atmospheric carbon dioxide levels and average global mean temperatures. And it has 
these curves on a timeline, and here at the bottom is the, the 2000s. What is remarkable, if I, had, if I had it, and I don't have it in this group of slides, but this, um, these curves have turned out to be remarkably accurate. So, I mean, it's, if you overlaid what's actually happening in 2020, it would be, it would be ex almost exactly where, where they predicted. Um, and Shell had the same, almost the same exact graph in its internal papers. Sorry. Um, like the Exxon papers, journalists have recently, more recently unearthed Shell internal documents from the 1980s. And they, they sh tell the same story that Shell, very well understood, was doing its own internal research, understood the connection between continued burning of fossil fuels and um, climate change. Uh, this, this top sentence is just chilling. I mean, they say in sort of clinical terms, large low-lying areas could be inundated, e.g. Bangladesh, and might have to be abandoned. <laughs> um, oh, well. Um, and by the time the global warming becomes detectable, it could be too late to take effective countermeasures to reduce the effects or even to stabilize the situation. This is 1988. So the industry by the, by the 1980s um, just absolutely well understood the, the seriousness of the situation and the connection between their products and these outcomes. They, you know, they had a decision to make, um, and that was whether to um, try to change the way that we get our energy um, or to double down and continue to profit from the continued consumption of these products. And they chose the, uh, the, the second alternative. Um, they organized and they began spending um, enormous amounts of money, um, literally billions of dollars to, to create doubt and to deceive the public and policymakers about the consequences of continued um, combustion of fossil fuels. Exxon was provided the leadership through the American Policy Institute in developing the industry association. Emphasize uncertainty. That was the goal. Exxon for years, when it was mobile, um, ran on the op-ed page of the New York Times these advertorials. They looked a lot like a fish, part of the official newspaper publication, but they had the mobile logo in the, in the bottom. And um, again and again, the topic of these advertorials was the doubt about the climate science. Um, the industry formed an organization called the Global Climate Coalition, which was active for 13 years. Um, William O'Keefe was the chairman. He was an API executive vice president. And he stated with a completely straight face in an op-ed in the, in the Washington Post in 1997, climate scientists don't say that burning oil, gas, and coal is steadily warming the earth. Um, more documents from the deception campaign. Victory will be achieved when average citizens understand, recognize uncertainties in the science. Unless climate change becomes a non-issue, there may be no moment when we can declare victory. Um, what we know is that this campaign was extremely successful. There were, uh, when George Bush Sr was he, he ran uh, in part on a platform to take action on, in 1988, to take action on climate. And there were a number of bills introduced in Congress that year that would have addressed the problem. None of that happened. Um, more recently, as the science has continued to mount um, and, and is really, there is no, um, no serious debate, even, even the industry now accepts publicly that there is this um, burning of fossil fuels causes global warming and causes climate change. Um, and so now what they're doing is greenwashing. And here are just some examples. This one from Chevron says, it's time oil companies get behind the development of renewable energy. 
We agree. But here's what they're really doing. These on the bottom, these are the percentages of their budgets that they are spending on renewable energy. And it's, um, it's, it's essentially nothing. So some of the cases, and back to this very busy chart, so a number of the, the public entities that have filed suit have included a consumer fraud or a Consumer Protection Act claim. Um, some of them, it is the only claim, like the District of Columbia, but a lot have included that claim um, based in part on this greenwashing. Um, the state of play, how am I doing time-wise? Oh, you're fine, Corey. Don't worry. Okay, I'll, I'll just, a couple more minutes. The, the state of play at this moment is um, the, the, the three cases or groups of cases that are farthest along are the Baltimore, the Rhode Island, and the California city and county cases. Um, there are, in addition to the Supreme Court's acceptance of review of this procedural issue, on state court versus federal court jurisdiction. Um, and it's a very narrow issue on the scope of review. The Supreme Court has in front of it two cases, two different cases um, concerning personal jurisdiction, um, where an injured party can sue an out of state company. Those are the Ford Motor cases. And the court heard argument on those um, in early October. And so two of our cases have been stayed pending the Supreme Court's decision in those Ford Motor cases. Um, we expect a decision in the first half. I mean, for, it will certainly be in the first half of next year. And, um, and we don't actually think those cases have any bearing on our cases. Um, but the trial court judges in the state courts have stayed our cases pending the outcome of those. So things are moving, but you know, the, the, the strategy has been delay. And we are now over three years since the first cases were filed and we are still engaged in these procedural skirmishes. The industry very much does not want us to get to the merits. Um, but um, we are getting there slowly, but surely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, why don't we, uh, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but um, maybe I could throw a question your way if that's all right. Sure. Um, so Corey, uh, it's quite remarkable the uh, range and volume of litigation that falls into the description um, that was the topic of this webinar. Have, has has that litigation been informed by other climate litigation in the U.S.? Like, what lessons have you learned from either earlier cases brought by public entities or other climate cases that you are now incorporating uh, in in this current uh, in this current group of cases? Um, I mean, I think uh, for sure we have. Um, and I'm not sure it, it so much has informed our thinking, but we are aware of other climate cases that have come before. Um, and specifically, there are two cases, one in the Ninth Circuit and one in the United States Supreme Court, that, that, found, uh, that held that federal nuisance claims um, cannot go forward because they are displaced by the Clean Air Act. Um, and so there is no right to bring a federal common law nuisance claim. We haven't pleaded federal nuisance. We have pleaded state law nuisance, which is a, it's an ancient tort. <laughs> you know, it comes from um, British law way before the United States even existed. Um, and so do, you know, most of our other claims really are, are common law claims. So, so for sure, um, you know, we, we distinguish our cases from those. And the other thing I would say that's, that's different from earlier climate litigation is the science is just stronger. 
um, on, and I know there's a, a webinar on this coming maybe next week, but um, the attribution science has gotten stronger and stronger, and it is now possible to identify different companies' contribution to, um, to carbon emissions and to global climate change. What about in terms of other co-panelists, other folks, does, does anyone else got a question for Corey here at this point? Stepan? I see one in the Q&A right now. <laughs> There's a couple of questions here. Uh, maybe I'll take the first one in line. Uh, and we'll probably return to this as well. Um, kind of goes to what you've just been talking about, actually. Looking at the strategies that have succeeded in the US, what, what uh, lessons might there be for us in Canada? What can we, what can we use uh, from what you have learned in terms of successful strategies? That's what I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. <laughs> I kind of thought that we, yeah, we might need to adjourn that. Uh, it is a good question. Um, I'm going to, yes. Okay, here's, a, here's another question that's um, a little bit more specific. And, and your, your firm does represent a lot of these plaintiffs. Uh, and the question is, what factors determine the decision to name specific companies in each piece of litigation? How, how do you make that determination? So in the cases where we are uh, asserting the common law claims, as opposed to just a consumer protection claim, because that's a somewhat different calculus, um, we name the largest, all of the largest oil companies that we can get jurisdiction over in that, in that state. Um, and so we have not limited the cases to one company or five companies. We are naming as many as we can get jurisdiction over. Um, and that is a little different strategy than some of the other cases have followed. Um, okay, and maybe one last question before we pass it over to Joe. And uh, we're all, I guess, wondering this in different ways. Um, what difference will a change in government uh, in the US, what, what difference is it gonna make to these cases, if any? Uh, you know, it's a really good question. I will say I've withdrawn my um, request for Canadian citizenship as of this morning. <laughs> um, that's a joke. Um, I, um, I, I mean, we'll see. Uh, you know, there has been talk um, for, for years now of um, congressional action to um, impose immunity, to grant immunity to the industry. So, and there has been a proposal that has floated around. It's never actually um, gotten that much traction. Um, but I don't know if the odds are greater or lesser that that will get more traction now. It, you know, our Senate is not, it's not clear how that's going to break. We have um, two seats that are going to run off in January. Um, I don't know. Time will tell. Well, thanks so much. You, you've set us off, given us a lot to think about, laid the table nicely for the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much, Corey. Thank you. So, Joe, uh, I'm going to pass it over to you to offer a bit of a response and a Canadian perspective on these issues. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, well, uh, that's a hard act to follow. Um, that was really quite riveting, Corey. And um, I loved your all your colorful PowerPoints and um, and whatnot. I, I'm afraid I don't have any of that. I'm going to do this sort of the old-fashioned way. Um, so my, I thought what I would do today would be to provide a little more of a kind of a 
hate to say it, but maybe a black letter law sort of approach to the problem. Um, Corey's um, emphasis on deception of, um, is something that we see as also fundamental to um, a lawsuit to be brought by municipalities against fossil fuel companies in, in Canada. Um, I have been advocating in different ways that uh, various municipalities bring such a lawsuit. I've even been trying to persuade the provincial government to enact legislation um, that would facilitate that kind of lawsuit in the same way that they have done so in the past with respect to um, tobacco litigation and more recently opioid litigation. But um, so far, um, those pleas have seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. And so um, my hope is that there will be municipalities who are prepared to uh, take up the challenge. And it is no doubt a daunting challenge. Um, and um, for no other reason that it will be extremely hard fought um, and defended by uh, companies with very deep pockets. Um, so I can, I understand the reticence, if you will, of uh, that, of, of any municipality um, not willing to sort of jump into it like they might in other kinds of cases. So what, what I thought I would do is just sort of map out kind of the essence of such a claim. Um, there are a number of different causes of actions, as Corey noted, that one might bring. Um, but I'm going to focus on sort of what I think are the, are the most obvious causes of action um, without, having, without having to um, push the envelope too far. <clears throat> I think I'd have to acknowledge even the conventional cause of action is going to involve some pushing of the envelope. Um, but the cause of action that I'm going to be that I recommend um, as the, sort of the most straightforward would be actions in, in nuisance, either private or public nuisance. And um, unlike the US um, uh, decisions, we don't have the doctrine of displacement that would bar us in Canada. Um, and to the extent that the US decisions um, have foundered on, on the political question doctrine or justiciability, we don't have the same um, type of doctrine here. And I know Chris is gonna talk about that a little bit, so I won't get into that. The, um, you know, just to sort of give you sort of some of the essentials, um, we would think that the, first of all, the potential defendants would be the big oil companies, the top four in the United States. They, because they actually, um, uh, represent a, a, a significant, uh, um, their, their GHG emissions represent a significant enough um, uh, contribution to climate change that we wouldn't be faced with uh, any kind of de minimis um, argument. Um, I, I saw one of the questions about uh, what about um, suing foreign state-owned or controlled companies like uh, Armaco in the United, in the Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, and um, um, and uh, Gazprom in in Russia, um, I think that that's worth considering. Um, obviously, there's sort of some real practical logistical difficulties suing um, state-owned um, companies, both in terms of potential sort of immunity claims and um, and and just the whole process of trying to get discovery from such com companies and enforcing any claim. But that's something that, that should be considered. Um, the, so nuisance um, is um, um, defined in two different ways, whether it's a public or private nuisance. And I'll just give you the basic. Uh, private nuisance is the unreasonable interference uh, with an occupier's use and enjoyment of his or her land. That's private nuisance. And public nuisance is the unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of a public right. 
And the same conduct can actually be both a public and a private nuisance. Um, the public nuisance in this case um, would be um, that the uh, excess, excessive concentration of GHG um, interferes with public health and safety through a variety of effects, um, including um, a, a water inundate, inundation as a result of sea level rise, storm surges and flooding, as well as extreme temperatures resulting in drought and forest fires. Um, we would say that this, those same conditions and its resulting effects may also constitute a private nuisance in that it's an unreasonable interference with the municipality's use and enjoyment of its own property. We would also argue um, a somewhat more novel claim of public nuisance, that there's a right to a healthy atmosphere and such that the pollution um, of GHG into that atmosphere would itself constitute an interference with the public right. Um, there, there may be issues of standing um, in when one sues um, in nuisance. Certainly when one sues in public nuisance, it's the conventional way to um, vindicate a, a, a public nuisance or a right to a public nuisance or a, a, to abate a public nuisance, I guess is a better way of putting it, is for the attorney general to be the plaintiff. Um, but um, there's uh, one clear way in which a, a non-attorney general or a private party can assert a public nuisance, and that's when the uh, damage caused to that private party is special damage. In other words, over and above that, which is caused to the public generally. And while at one time the courts required a difference both in kind and degree of harm, uh, the more modern view is that recovery is permitted in either case as long as the damage to the plaintiff is more than a mere infringement of a theoretical right which the plaintiff shares with everyone else. Um, so um, we say the municipality would, um, I think, easily satisfy the modern test of special damage and be able to sue in public um, public nuisance. Um, and, and one of the reasons is that is that um, municipalities have specific and unique responsibilities relating to maintaining infrastructure and providing essential services to its, to, uh, its, to its um, citizens. And climate change impacts significantly, uh, impacts significantly on the, uh, uh, the, the cost of fulfilling those responsibilities. Um, and what we also say that it's arguable at least that the, that the municipality is a public body charged with protecting public rights should have standing to enforce those public rights, even absent special damage. Uh, we accept, uh, we recognize there is some jurisprudence that goes the other way, but that's never really stopped us um, from trying to change the law. And I think uh, we have a decent chance of doing that. Um, the, um, when we get into the uh, substance of whether the um, claim of nuisance can succeed, the, um, it, whether it's public or private nuisance, the plaintiffs must show that the interference complained of is unreasonable. Um, the court's assessment of reasonableness is, uh, um, is an exercise in uh, balancing interests and involves a holistic assessment of all the relevant circumstances. And so relevant factors in determining whether the nuisance is an unreasonable interference with the use or enjoyment of either private or public land would be the utility of the defendant's conduct, the severity of the harm, the difficulty of avoiding the interference, the quality of the interference, and whether the defendant acted recklessly, carelessly, or with malice. The list of factors are not closed, and the ultimate question is whether it's fair in all the circumstances for the plaintiffs um, 
burden, um, whether the plaintiffs, sorry, I'm just checking my notes, whether, whether it's fair for the plaintiff to bear the burden imposed by the defendant's activity without compensation. In this case, of course, the, we would say the interference is severe um, and, um, and sort of em emphasizing the points that Corey made that we would say the defendant's conduct that is relevant in this case is that the fossil fuel activities and circumstances where the defendants were aware that the use of the products would lead to severe harm. It'd be important to emphasize that, uh, that, that it requires specialized expertise to understand the implication of widespread use of fossil fuels, that the companies had that expertise and understood those implications, and that the companies not only failed to warn users of those implications, but actively sought to mislead the public and prevent a consensus from developing around the link between fossil fuel products and the harms which constitute the interference. As a result of the defendant's failure to warn and deceitful actions, and of their continued promotion of these products in the face of their own knowledge, the use of these products continued unabated, and the condition which imposed harms on the plaintiff local government was created. In our view, all of this is very relevant to whether it is reasonable for the local governments to be asked to bear the cost of this harm themselves. Now, of course, the defendants will argue that their products have great social utility, unlike say tobacco or perhaps even um, opioid drugs, and that this fact should weigh heavily in the reasonableness analysis. They may try to characterize their actions as not merely profit driven, but also as providing much needed energy to, Can to Canadians and globally. The argument will be that everyone, including municipalities, benefited from the use of fossil fuels and that it is not unreasonable to expect the municipality to bear its share of the harm that flowed from that use. We say the social utility of a defendant's conduct is usually considered in nuisance cases involving the balancing the importance of a public work against harm to the plaintiff. In such cases, the courts have rejected a simple balancing of the utility of a public work against the severity of harm, since a high degree of public utility would always trump even very um, extensive interference. The Supreme Court of Canada has stated that private rights cannot be trampled on in the name of the public good. The question being not simply whether the public good outweighed the individual interference when the two are assigned equal weight but rather whether the interference is greater than the individual should be expected to bear in the public interest without compensation. And what it's important to emphasize that a case of the nature that we're talking about does not involve a public project where the social utility perhaps should have a heightened sense of importance, but rather the harm caused by the continuing manufacture, promotion, and sale of a product that generated immense profit for the defendants. Um, moreover, we would say that the Canadian society has largely accepted the, um, the, that polluters should pay for the harm their products cause. The polluter pay principle, as it's called, is not only fair, but has been widely accepted in Canadian environmental law and recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada. Economists have long called for the internalization of the cost of pollution. In hiding and denying the harms caused by their products, the defendants have escaped paying for the full cost of the harm caused by their products. In doing so, if proven, they've acted recklessly, if not with actual malice. Now, uh, finally, and I see the time, I'll just end by recognizing um, that one of the defenses that we will face will deal with um, causation. Um, the one causation issue relates to the fact that while the um, defendant fossil fuel companies extracted and refined the fossil fuels and marketed the products that created the GHG emissions when used, it was a multitude of individual and corporate consumers who actually burned those fuels and thus released the GHGs that caused the climate change. 
it's true that um, that the um, um, that the fossil fuel companies themselves clearly contribute to GHG emissions through their own activities of extracting and processing and transporting their products. Indeed, that's a significant um, significant contribution to GHG emissions. But it's the use of the fossil fuel products which give rise to the most significant emissions by a factor of at least 10 times as much. So this raises the question of whether companies who have developed, manufactured, and marketed a product, the future of which will inevitably cause a nuisance, can be held responsible for creating that nuisance when it, um, the, the actual um, use of it was by, by consumers. Um, Uh, we say that, um, well, we haven't seen any Canadian cases where manufacturers were liable and nuisance. The, we say that the large degree of integration in the energy sector and the knowledge of the defendants about the harm their products would inevitably cause if used as intended um, might support um, uh, some creation of jurisprudence that would be favorable in this case. Uh, the point is that the act of consumers in choosing to buy and use the uh, proposed defendant's products is not an intervening act that breaks the chain of causation um, between the defendant's acts and the harm suffered by the municipalities. It's actually the intended use of their product. So I think, um, well, I suppose um, there's one, one other causation point that I'll deal with and then I'll, I think I'll Wrap, well, I'll wrap it up if I've got a couple more minutes, Chris. Um, okay. Um, the other, of course, um, argument that we will face is that um, in the, the, that in, there are many other sort of companies out there that contributed to GHG emissions, and why should um, uh, four defendants say if they were if there were four, four or five defendants saying why should they uh, bear the cost? Um, Oh, hold on, I just see a message on my screen that I have a low battery. I have to find my plug. I'm glad you noticed that, Joe. That happened to me yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're, we're good. Um, so we would say that um, just because there are other people in um, that contribute to the nuisance doesn't um, doesn't sort of allow the defendants who otherwise clearly contributed to get off the hook. The um, there's in in nuisance there's also of course the defense of statutory authority. We can see that defense being asserted here, and I can maybe talk about that later if somebody wants to explore that with me. There's also the possibility of contributory negligence um, in the sense that municipalities themselves, indeed all of us contribute to climate change in one way or the other, but th that fact shouldn't sort of um, uh, somehow provide a defense to the fossil fuel companies because after all, at the end of the day, all we're asking for is that they bear their proportionate share um, and, not the, um, uh, and not one that should be um, attributed to other uh, other guilty parties, so to speak. So I think I'll end at that then, Chris. Excellent, thank you so much, Joe. And in fact, uh, bravo, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, you answered squarely uh, the question that was posed in the Q&A to you from Matt Hulse, hey Matt, uh, which had to do with uh, uh, liability for the uh, end use. And so I think that was, uh, I think that was covered. Um, I don't know if I see any other questions. Well, oh, one thing, Joe, before we m maybe move on, I know in the opinion that you do consider uh, using the class action uh, vehicle uh, to, uh, to pursue this kind of litigation. Can you offer any thoughts on, on that at all? Um. Not many, <laughs> because I'm not a class action lawyer, um, but we have um, collaborated with uh, 
very skilled class action lawyers, and it's their view that a class action would be um, the uh, an appropriate way to proceed. Uh, in one a huge advantage, um, at least in bringing a class action in British Columbia, is that there's a no cost. We're in a no cost regime, and so the that should. Um, um, allay some of the concerns that municipalities would have that if they succeed, if they brought the class action, if they brought an action and lost, they would be uh, saddled with a very, very uh, punishing cost award. That won't happen in British Columbia. But, um, you know, it, 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 a, a, a municipality like Vancouver is probably big enough, it could do it on its own. And of course, with less complexity, class actions have bring a lot of procedural complexity. That's why I, I don't like doing them myself. Um, but of course, there's um, there's a, a great sort of economies of scale, if you will, by bringing a class action. Thanks, Joe. So I think uh, there are some other questions kind of percolating in the Q and A, which I think we'll try to uh, meld together. Um, when we get to uh, the end here through the presentations. It's my turn to try to uh, uh, use this technology here. I'm going to, where did it go? Wait a second. Can people see that? All right. So uh, like I said, uh, Joe, Joe kind of got into the black letter law. I, I might even get in a bit deeper here, although I know that our audience is diverse, so I'm not going to try to, um, you know, be too professorial here. But I do, I do think that this question of justiciability is an important one. Um, it's important for a variety of reasons. And as we kind of ponder seriously bringing these kinds of cases, I think especially in Canada, we have to think about our legal culture and the role of justiciability. And that's front, that's front and center for Joe and I and our legal team on the rose, because that obviously was one of the grounds that Justice Manson relied on last week to uh, grant a dismissal of our case. It's a very powerful, it's a very decisive defense. It can be um, brought, usually is brought at the outset of litigation. Courts rehearse, you know, that it's supposed to be rarely available. Um, and uh, I think uh, for the most part, the record shows that it is pretty rare. Um, but what's interesting is, and, and I, I'm not an expert in American law, so it's a little bit intimidating to be doing this presentation in front of Corey, but uh, I, I think it's fair to say this, that both in Canada and in the US, uh, that when it comes to climate cases, justiciability has a better than a normal batting average when you compare it to other areas of litigation. And what's troubling about that not only is that these cases don't get to trial, but that in Canada at least, that the governing legal principles uh, that are there to fetter and to sort of prescribe how these decisions are made uh, are very amorphous and underdeveloped. Um, and on top of it, I think fundamentally, foundationally, really, uh, what this doctrine really goes to is the nature of our legal system, the role of the courts. When is a matter capable of being adjudicated? Should it be adjudicated? And when should courts uh, be able to exercise the discretion to abstain from adjudicating? So I think there's some important stuff at stake here, and, and, and I'm not going to read these two passages. Uh, there, I think these are both pretty good quotes. Uh, one is from the transcript of the actual motion to dismiss argument from my friend Joe, who uh, did have to deal with the issue of justiciability, and I think in his excellent way was able to really simplify it down to two considerations, which I think really are true to the case law. One, one of the considerations is the institutional capacity of the courts. Is this something that the courts are good at doing or capable of doing? And then secondly, is it something that they ought to do? Is, is, is there some reason that they should defer to some other branch of government who, who, who may be better positioned or maybe already dealing with that matter? 
So I think that's kind of the customary framing is that it's institutional capacity and legitimacy. These are the two kind of uh, key factors. But what's interesting in the other quote, and this is from perhaps Canada's leading case on justiciability in the climate setting, is Justice Barnes' quote, where he, he, he suggests that, of course, it's about institutional capacity and legitimacy. But then he goes on to say, there's other reasons out there. We, we can never define in advance what other reasons might allow a court, make it perfectly proper for a court uh, to decline jurisdiction, to decide that something's non-justiciable. And therein lies the problem that, that we, you know, in this leading case, and I think in a lot of the jurisprudence, there's real confusion about when it would be and what kind of situation it is appropriate for a court to decline jurisdiction. And, you know, if you dive into the case law, and I'm not going to do that today, I'm sure you're going to be happy to hear that. If you dive into the case law, you see at least two strains of authority. There's a less deferential strain, a strain that basically asserts that courts should step up and deal with issues even if they're complicated and even if sometimes they may, uh, in the words of the uh, Supreme Court of Canada in Operation Dismantle, they may in involve weighty matters of state. Um, because to do otherwise is to, is to relinquish their function. And Oper Operation Dismantle was an interesting case. It was a case where cabinet had basically authorized low level cruise missile testing. And this was one of the very first charter cases. And it was important for the court to say, no, we're not going to adopt a, polit a US style political questions doctrine and, and, and abstain from adjudicating this case. Um, although they did dismiss it on other grounds, of course. Um, but, a, but a more deferential strain of justiciability uh, reasoning, I think, is becoming dominant or is at least emerging. And I would, I would trace it to Tanajaja, which is the Ontario Court of Appeal decision in 2014, where the court says that uh, it's not a simple matter uh, uh, of kind of looking at institutional capacity and legitimacy that, that it really requires this, where, where justiciability is raised as an argument, the court must pay really close scrutiny to what is the alleged legal component of the case. In particular, is there a judicially discoverable and manageable standard that a court can apply here? Um, and by the way, that's a terminology that comes out of American law. I think we've adopted it really without really thinking it through, but that, that is, we'll come to the case which talks about that. Um, also what Tanajaja does, and, uh, and I, I think this is potentially problematic as well, is that Tanajaja uh, says that we have to look at the uh, remedy that's being sought and ask the question of whether the remedy will redress the harm. And, and, and if there's some question about that, that's another reason that the case may be non-justiciable. So I would say that the case that was handed down last week, LaRose, aligns very much with this more deferential strain. In fact, I think it goes further than any other case has in, the, in, in this deference, but I'll come to that a bit later. Before I do that, I want to just talk a little bit about justiciability or political questions in the US context. And it, it's a rich history. Many, many law articles have been written on it. I've probably only read a couple of them. Uh, the, the, uh, the doctrine goes back really to the very earliest days of the Republic, to Marbury and Madison. Uh, and in, in that case, uh, the court recognizes, I think, that it is important to give the executive branch the ability to perform its duties, especially discretionary duties without interference, without undue interference by the judicial branch. But it also says very clearly uh, that, the role, that there is a very important and exclusive role of the courts, and that is to protect individual rights. And, and, and so that's kind of the takeaway from Marbury and Madison is that you're looking to, to see where on that spectrum of things a case falls. And if it, if it involves the 
uh, impacts on individual rights, then that isn't a political question. That is a legal question that the court must decide. Now, it took the US Supreme Court, you know, quite a number of years uh, uh, before Marbury and, Marbury and Madison was eclipsed as the leading authority. We now have Baker and Carr 1962. And this is the test that all of the political questions cases makes reference to. Uh, it's quite a nuanced judgment. It enunciates six factors, but the conventionally they're thought of as falling into three categories and three, three real questions that a court must ask uh, itself when deciding if something raises an impermissible political question. One is assignment. Has the matter, has the question been assigned to another branch of government explicitly? And, and, and usually if it has that ends, that's gonna end the matter. But that's, that's usually a rare thing. Then secondly, appropriateness. And this really goes to the question of institutional capacity. Appropriateness means, is the court equipped? Does it have the competence? Does it have the tools in this case to answer the question? And that's where this judicial, judicially discoverable manageable standard language comes from. Um, and then thirdly, deference. And this is kind of a catch-all. The last few factors in the Baker and Card test have to do with, you know, maintaining good relations, maintaining the separation of powers in a healthy way, not doing things that could potentially disrupt or interfere with the proper separation of powers. So that's the test. And I, I, I think it's a good test, not that we'd want to cut and paste it for Canada, but I think at least it sets out some principles and some questions which I think we, we desperately need to try to identify for ourselves. The other good thing about Baker, I think, is that it sets up a test that is going to be hard to meet, you know, that the courts have rarely used. They haven't struck uh, on a regular basis cases out based on a political questions doctrine. Although, although it's interesting, and, and of course, Corey's dealing with a new generation of cases who, who don't seem to have been hobbled by this, but Early on, at least in climate litigation in the US, we did see uh, political questions being raised and being used as a successful basis for uh, dismissing to dismissing cases. The two, I think, m probably the two best known ones are Kivalina and Comer. So I want to talk about these. These are actually cases very similar to the kind of case that Corey's talking about, the cases that we're going to be thinking about doing here. In both of these cases, when the matter went to district court, the judge at the district court level dismissed on the basis of political questions doctrine, although that was overturned later in the Comer case in a really fine set of reasons by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal. So let me just do a, a little bit of a dive into each of these two cases so you can see how the issue comes up. In Kivalina, of course, you've seen pictures of this probably, it's a tiny little Inuit village on a peninsula that's being buffeted by the seas because it's lost all of the Arctic, the protective Arctic ice. And in this case, uh, they, they sue, and this has become kind of a conventional bifurcation. You sue with the, the kind of traditional torts, but then you also sue alleging uh, a market manipulation, conspiracy, and et cetera. So this is one of those cases where they try to, to, uh, to uh, uh, spread their bats a little bit by uh, pleading these two different types of causes of action. And they're also seeking damages, not an injunction, which is, I think, again, to try to ensure that the court uh, doesn't dismiss the case early on because injunctions are considered to be more problematic from a political questions point of view. The judge here, you know, <laughs> I read the decision just the other day again, and the judge here really goes to work here on the political question. She, she, she really works it uh, hard. And basically saying that these lawsuits uh, involve a clear intrusion on political or uh, uh, policy choices and value judgments that have been committed, that have been exclusively committed to other branches of government, uh, uh, obviously echoing the Baker and Carr test. But she also says that here, that th this is a case, these are kinds of cases that um, uh, raise questions of judicial expertise. 
that when it comes to, and this is fascinating really, because Joe's talked about social utility and balancing. What this judge says is that, that, that um, because of the nature of our reliance on fossil fuels and the presumed utility of the defendant's conduct over time, that, that, that although the, the court would be applying uh, a well understood test, that this would be to engage in policy making, that this would be uh, basically taking over the job and, 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 and entering into a field better suited to Congress or to the executive. And she dismisses on that, and she dismisses on that footing. Um, right around the same time, of course, uh, we see other suits being brought of a similar variety. Comer is one that's brought uh, in, the, in the Fifth Circuit uh, by residents of the Miss Mississippi Gulf that have been impacted by uh, climate change and, and in particular by a very severe impacts associated with Hurricane Katrina. You can see that they've pleaded both traditional torts as well as market uh, manipulation related torts and conspiracy. And again here, the district court in, in, oral, re in oral reasons that are unreported apparently uh, dismisses both on standing and on justiciability. But the reason that I wanted to bring this case forward is that, uh, that the decision in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal is powerful and well-reasoned and basically echoing Marbury and Madison says, look, the job of courts is emphatically to say what the law is um, and that federal courts have to be very reluctant to decline jurisdiction and especially in a situation here where, where what is being invoked are common law tort claims, that, that it, would, it would be a very exceptional case that that would be seen to be non-justiciable, especially given that the remedy that's being sought is not injunctive. <clears throat> now those cases go back a little ways, but I, I think that, you know, the issues, the, the concerns uh, and, and of course, the, the, the strategy on the part of defendants, I think, is going to be similar in Canada. We're going to see justiciability raised, and there's no doubt. And, and so let me just talk a little bit about the, Cana the applicable Canadian law and then f and end on LaRose and maybe what, what lies ahead. Uh, I've already referred to Friends of the Earth Canada, Justice Barnes' decision, where he says, yeah, of course, it's, it's in capacity and legitimacy, but it's also other stuff. I know it when I see it. So, so that case doesn't really advance the cause at all in terms of helping us to understand what the applicable principles are. Um, perhaps, and, and there are three youth-led climate cases before the courts presently, Anjou in Quebec, which is a class action case going up to the Court of Appeal where the, it was dismissed uh, on procedural grounds, certification grounds, but on justice, justiciability, uh, it was found uh, to, to uh, be a valid claim. Uh, Mathur that was argued in July, we're waiting for reasons in that case. That's a narrower case that focuses on uh, the rollback of, uh, of uh, uh, greenhouse gas targets in Ontario. And then LaRose, which uh, was argued on a motion to dismiss, it was argued at the end of September. And in very quick and fairly brief reasons, um, uh, recently dismissed. Uh, including on the ground of justiciability. So I think these cases may, all three of them, have something to say about justiciability. And they may, one of them or more of them may go up to the SCC on that point. Um, it's always dangerous, I suppose, to comment on a case that you were involved in, that's pending appeal, we are gonna appeal this case. So I'm gonna to try to be very fair and scrupulous in terms of reprising what Justice Manson has to say. But I, I think it is fair, entirely fair to say that Justice Manson uh, believes in his reasons that there are certain legitimacy, no-go zones, where the question is too political, um, where uh, engaging in a, the answering of the question would um, pose such a, d a danger or risk to the legislative or executive branches that even though the question 
at its core is a legal one, is a, is, it has a core legal component that the question must be deemed to be justiciable. Now, I think this takes the law to a new place in Canada. Um, although Justice Manson would agree, as, as Joe argued, that you know, policy or political questions are justiciable once they get translated into law, what Justice Manson says is that in certain areas uh, of, of, of policy, of public policy, and he, he gives some examples, prostitution, right to die, drugs, homelessness, in certain areas, uh, in his view, these, these areas uh, raise questions that are so political that courts really can't deal with them, even if there is a legal component uh, that presents itself for determination. So this is a new approach, I think, to justiciability. It's a per se approach uh, that, that, that seems to, I, I would argue, create areas that are immune from uh, questioning under the rule of law, even where the lawsuit carefully is crafted to pose a legal question. And I think Justice Bart, or sorry, Justice Manson kind of doubles down on that when he looks at the remedies we were seeking in that case, is what, what we wanted were, were declarations of rights and uh, on top of it, we wanted, in light of Canada's abysmal failure to, to meet its targets and to deal with this problem, we wanted uh, the court to retain supervision through a form of injunction that would uh, ask the government to come up with a science-based, a credible science-based plan that the, that, the, uh, that the court from time to time uh, would uh, review in terms of whether it had brought Canada into compliance with its obligations under the Charter and the Public Trust Doctrine. And, and uh, I think we knew almost immediately in the hearing that Justice Manson was not um, a fan of that remedy. And in his judgment, he's basically said that remedy puts us offside, per se. Um, that that is an incursion into the uh, business of the other branches of government. So I'm going to wrap up with some thoughts then in terms of justiciability and the road ahead here. Uh, I haven't mentioned this case, Smith and Inco, and all environmental law teachers teach this case, and it can be a bit of a painful experience to do that because what it reinforces every time you look at this case is the conservatism of, our, of some of our courts when it comes to um, uh, seizing the common law as a vehicle to protect the environment. And, and Smith and Inco is a reminder of that inertia. So I think that as a starting point, we, we know that that's there. We know from Smith and Inco that that inertia and that attitude is there, that temperament is there. And, 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 I, and I think that everything else being equal, that that would translate into the kind of judgment that you saw at the district court in Kivalina or at Comer, that it would translate into a very deferential just, justiciability analysis. However, I guess, uh, on the other hand, if you look at Comer in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal, you, you, you see a much more nuanced and balanced approach, which, and, and, and I think this is very true of this kind of litigation, that the questions that are being brought, being brought forward are quintessentially legal questions. They ask if there's been a tort committed, there's a certain kind of well-established series of questions that you have to ask and answer to be able to deal with that. And the, and the remedies in these cases are, are conventional in the extreme. We're just seeking damages. So I, I think there's a strong argument against a deferential justiciability analysis in these cases. But here's the thing. I call it the LaRose wildcard. What are we supposed to make of this idea that there are certain questions that are just too political in policy, in certain policy areas that are just too political, even if they have a legal component, does that put them out of reach? Does that put them into a judicial no-go zone? Is our, is our regrettable reliance on fossil fuels and all that has come from that, is that one of those political areas that Justice Manson is talking about? Presumably so per se. Uh, it doesn't matter what the legal component is. 
per se, that is too political. Therefore, the justiciability doctrine is, is uh, in play. And likewise with redressability. Now, I don't think that's so much an issue for fossil fuels, but um, yeah, I guess my bottom line is this, as of you know a week ago or 10 days, whenever we got that judgment, I think it's fair to say our justiciability law in Canada has gotten even more uncertain and more unsatisfactory. And that's especially true in climate litigation. But I, I think uh, the, the decision of Justice Manson should raise questions and concerns more broadly as well. Thank you. Okay, so uh, can I? Uh, well, somebody has asked Joe what our grounds for appeal will be, and as as you're the lead counsel, I'm going to give that one to you. Um, that he's everything he said was wrong. <laughs> well, it's true. Um, we disagree with him on justiciability. We would disagree with him on not being able to uh, demonstrate a reasonable cause of action. Um, I can get into it in more detail, but I think we'd be off topic. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I see another question or two here, um, but what, what I would, I guess, suggest that we do is go to Linda now. Uh, and then we'll kind of try to weave these all these great questions together into some discussion at the end. Um, great. Yeah. So with that, I think I'll pass it over to you, Linda. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that all of these topics are very interconnected. And in fact, I'm going to focus on kind of the hybridization of public and private approaches. That is the statutory modification of tort law to allow municipalities and provinces to possibly recover for climate related damages. And interestingly enough, justiciability is one of the reasons that people have sort of been pushed to look at tort approaches because it's virtually unheard of in the Canadian context for a tort suit to be dismissed on justiciability grounds. It can certainly happen, but it's much more common in the public law field. And yet, as Professor Tolleson tells us, if you look at the case on environmental torts in Canada, it's very clear that tort courts actually don't want to do environmental law. Um, I published a piece on nuisance law and as Corey correctly observed, you know, it goes back 800 years and in fact was the only form of environmental law in the common law world for many, many um, decades and centuries. And yet we're now in a scenario where courts don't see it that way. And in fact, they don't want to do broad environmental policy through tort suits. And so even if they can't kick you out on the basis of justiciability or even standing, we see them, in fact, modifying classic uh, tort doctrine in order to squeeze out these cases, which is what happened in Smith and Inco. And then the other appellate cases that followed Smith and Inco um, sort of in its most uh, not only regressive uh, holdings, but in fact, it, it's most deviant holdings from the, the tort elements of, as they had existed for decades and decades. So this puts us in a situation of needing some help. Uh, I know that there are some law students on the webinar. So just as a reminder for all of us, uh, statute is superior to the common law. And so in fact, legislatures can make virtually any change to the common law as long as it's constitutional. And so uh, a kind of Climate Change Cost Recovery Act could actually do all kinds of wild and wonderful things, all the way from standing down to damages. So for example, uh, such a statute could clarify and confirm the provinces and municipalities parents' patriae standing to recover for aggregate harms on behalf of the public interest as a whole in, in its jurisdiction such a statute could change the special injury rule. And in fact, we've seen this done in Ontario's Environmental Bill of Rights, which has a provision that says 
that no litigant shall be barred from suing in nuisance simply public nuisance simply because she doesn't have a special injury, one that differs in kind from that of the general public. So that could be done. Um, in negligence, there's all kinds of really helpful modifications that could take place. So for example, those of you who have recently taken your torts class will recall the first and threshold question in a negligence suit is duty of care. And under Anne's Cooper stage one, we first ask whether there's proximity and foreseeability of harm. But then under Anne's Cooper stage two, the court can actually throw out a duty that would otherwise exist if it would produce the threat of indeterminate liability. And this is an obvious concern in climate litigation, no matter who the plaintiff is. In fact, you know, duties of care recognized in this context almost certainly will produce certainly very, very broad liability. And you know, Heather McLeod Kilmurray, my colleague at U of O, has always said there's this very strange perverse incentive created under Anne's Cooper stage two, which is the more people you harm, the less likely you are to be held liable in negligence. And so that could be dealt with in a statute. Standard of care, um, the statute could clarify, for example, that purveying false and misleading information to regulators and the public is de facto un, or de jure unreasonableness under the standard of care analysis. And then obviously we come to, you know, what's been one of my main interests since 2005, which is this problem of toxic causation. And causation has been the uh, most forbidding barrier to success across environmental torts as a whole, and certainly is a problem in climate litigation. Now, everybody will recall uh, in the context of the tobacco healthcare cost recovery acts, those statutes tried to lessen the causation problem by specifying that provinces could adduce their evidence of damages on an aggregate basis. They didn't have to prove causation of injury in particular individuals and then aggregate those all together. They just had to prove the total costs in their province uh, flowing from tobacco related damages. And they had to prove what's called generic causation, that tobacco is capable of causing the injuries for which they are um, seeking compensation. And the statute also specified um, the admissibility of statistical and epidemiological evidence. I think it probably already was admissible, but you know, it was definitely helpful to, to clarify. And so you could see all of these kinds of um, modifications in a, in a climate statute as well. It's definitely more complicated. There's no question. Um, for example, the statute will have to think carefully about which companies it wants to assert jurisdiction over. Because if you're just suing companies that operate within your province, the causation question I think becomes quite a bit more complicated. So let me just back up a little. I, sh I should have said at the outset, the default causation test in this kind of case is going to be the test of material contribution to risk that was articulated by the Supreme Court of Canada in Clements and Clements. And as you all know, you know, the, in the overwhelming majority of torts cases, we're stuck with but for causation. We imagine a hypothetical scenario in which the defendant never breached the standard of care. We ask whether the injury would have happened nonetheless. And if it what would have, causation fails. You're not a but for cause. In Clements and Clements, the Supreme Court of Canada innovated and it essentially actually went beyond market share liability, which up until then was one of the most progressive approaches to causation that we knew, to deal with the scenario of the indeterminate defendant. Exactly the problem we have in climate litigation. And of course, the famous case that many of you will have studied was out of the US, the Sindel case involving this drug DES that was taken by pregnant women caused devastating cancers in their daughters, but not until the daughters hit puberty. These were hormonally mediated cancers and it took time for them to manifest. By that time, many of the moms had lost any proof of which manufacturer produced the drug that she took. Nonetheless, 
these young women sued all across the country and in most jurisdictions in the states they lost because although having named you know the various manufacturers they could show against each one a duty of care that there was a breach of the standard of care well who caused the loss each one could point the finger at the other and so in Sindel the court holds well this is manifestly unjust develops this new um, uh, approach market share liability and says each defendant will be liable for the proportion of damages that matches its market share at the time that the, that the drug was ingested. The Tobacco Healthcare Cost Recovery Act took a similar approach um, and allowed courts to impose liability based on the defendants, the tobacco manufacturers market share. I think this becomes a little bit more difficult and kind of dissatisfying um, in climate suits because there's going to be a strong argument. There's going to be an outcry from industry that you're asking local companies, those who, who operate in your jurisdiction, to bear a proportion of a global harm. And, you know, that could be potentially to, in fact, bankrupt um, an entire industry in the province, which is sort of the deepest fear of many Canadians, including some who sit on the Supreme Court of Canada, we, we saw this very overtly in the carbon pricing case when Justice Rowe from Newfoundland actually said, restricting the fossil fuel industry is an existential threat to Newfoundland. So uh, I, I think this is gonna be a more complicated uh, conversation than the, the tobacco, which as you know, took many years, we didn't even dip our toe in that water until it had already been widely done in the United States. Then there was multiple years of litigation going all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada um, before the provinces were able to draft constitutionally sustainable statutes. But I think it's doable. And, you know, if I was in the shoes of municipalities right now, I would be thinking about crafting the request for relief um, in such a way that it might mitigate some of these problems. Now, just full disclosure, I learned this from Vic Share, who worked with Corey. I worked with Vic Share 20 years ago in San Francisco. And at that time, the firm was doing nothing but contaminated ground, drinking water litigation, um, specifically dealing with this contaminant MTBE from the oil company. So same deal in, in terms of um, suing all the oil companies and, and their incredible procedural machinations and you know, real passion for avoiding uh, a hearing on the merits. But what made the cases so much easier was Vic had discovered this incredible end run around the causation problem. So rather than representing individuals who were sick and wanted to say they were sick because of methyl tertiary butyl ether, the firm was representing water purveyors, water districts, municipalities, and states who had the duty to provide clean water. And there were regulatory requirements that said you cannot provide water with the contaminants above the statutory maximum contaminant level. And so once the MTB crossed that MCL, it was essentially a chemical drought. You know, the, they were essentially out of usable water. And so all you had to prove on causation was the numbers. You just adduced, you know, the readings that showed I'm above the MCL. And therefore, I have to remediate, and here's the cost of remediation. So I think one possibility for municipalities is really to focus on climate mitigation costs. And I know that this, we see this in some of the American litigation. It's, it's not a new idea, but I think it's a really key idea and an exciting idea because, of course, climate mitigation costs are huge. It would still be a wonderful contribution to the public purse to get to recover some of the money that governments will need to be spending proactively, you know? And that just takes me to the final thing that I wanted to say, which is that I don't think a climate change uh, cost recovery act is actually a pipe dream. Um, Heather McLeod Camilleri and I started writing about this back in 2013 in our book, The Canadian Law of Toxic Torts, and Andrew Gage was writing it about that time, writing about it also at that time. And then in 2017, Martin Roshinsky, Sharon Masher, and Meinhard Doel did a really interesting deep dive into this. Um, if anybody's interested in it, check out their article. It's, it's superb. Comparing 
you know, at a very granular and helpful level, the, the tobacco context and the climate change context. But they opened the article with, I think, quite a brilliant sort of scene setting of imagining uh, Canada in 2030. And they optimistically say by then we've hopefully avoided uh, catastrophic climate change, but there's massive increases in climate related costs, which is everything from roads and buildings collapsing in the north as we lose permafrost to tropical illnesses moving north, obviously problems with air quality because of extreme heat events, you know, wildfires and floods. We already have very compelling data on massive increases in government spending for natural disasters. If that increases categorically, I think you really could have a moment, a historical moment where municipalities and provinces realize that in fact, they need contributions from the industries that, that produced these products. Um, and again, you know, it's, Joe is absolutely right that manufacturer liability for nuisance is certainly not established in Canada. And, you know, it was tested to an extent in the genetically modified drift case of Hoffman and Monsanto and, and you know, failed. But again, that could be completely handled by a statute. Manufacturer liability to consumers and negligence is well established. I think it's a much grayer area, the idea of manufacturer liability to sort of the public at large for a product that is, that is used by consumers. Uh, but I think through careful drafting, these things could be dealt with. And just a final note of optimism. A few years back when uh, Roger Cox came to town to speak about the agenda case, I had the opportunity to speak with some judges, retired judges at the time, um, who had attended the same presentation that I did. And on that particular presentation, I was actually surprised that Roger spent about an hour on climate science. And uh, to, uh, just total honesty, I was bored. I was thinking, why are you telling this? Everyone knows this. But afterwards, when I spoke with this particular judge, she said, you know what, I didn't know that. Judges don't know this. And if you put those facts before a Canadian judge, she would find a remedy. And so what I take heart in is that the cases, you know, starting with carbon pricing are going up. And every time I watch one of these cases, I think the, the most significant thing I'm seeing is mandatory judicial education. You know, they're a captive audience. They have to listen, they have to learn. And no one hopes that this will trickle down because this idea that judges don't have the capacity it's just fear, you know, it's, it's not, they're not afraid of political issues. They told us that same sex spouses have to have rights. They, they inserted sexual orientation into the charter, rightly so, you know, they've opined on the Omar Cotter matter. They've ordered the government to reopen safe injection sites. I mean, they have opined on the conditions under which Quebec could separate from the rest of the nation. <laughs> Our courts are not afraid of political questions, but they are terrified of science. And I think this gradual process of judicial education on climate is probably the most um, encouraging thing that I, that I can find in the legal landscape right now around, around climate litigation. And I'll just leave it at that. Beautiful, well done. Uh, and you've opened up a lot of areas for discussion, I think, Linda, as you always do. Um, I guess one of them, and, and I, let me riff off a couple of questions that are in the Q and A. And, and this question may also be one that uh, Joe and Corey will want to weigh in on. Um, what would this statute look like? What are the key things that needs to be need to be included in this statute? Um, obviously, you can borrow from the Tobacco Act and so on and uh, there's other exemplars out there but can you give us a thumbnail and i guess for corey has ha, has in the u.s this statutory route uh, been explored and and what progress has been made and so yeah throw it out throw it to all three of you really yeah i mean i'll just super just to just to summarize again i think I'd like to see modifications of both nuisance and negligence. So to deal with um, standing and special injury and nuisance. In negligence, I think we you have to deal with Hans Cooper stage two. So there needs to be a provision saying that um, no court shall decline to find a duty of care because of the scope of indeterminate liability. 
I think standard care is actually going to be easy. We probably don't need help with standard care, but the causation provisions are going to need to be fairly detailed. And I, like, I would hope for an open um, dialogue about how far we want to reach. Um, and I guess how big a price that we want to place on companies that operate within the province, right. or if in fact we want to try to assert jurisdiction over all of the players, because, you know, in the, the Clements test for material contribution to risk requires that you show but for causation against a group yeah. before you can recover for material contribution to risk. Now, if you pass that, it's awesome because it's joint and several liability. So you can take 100% of your losses from anybody in the dependent group. But to get past that first step of showing but for causation against a group, you're going to have to join. You know, I think he did that study saying that there were about 90 major players that were responsible for 63% of emissions worldwide. So you'd have to join at least that those 90. Um, and you know, that's a pretty daunting prospect for most yeah. Canadian law firms. And uh, it's, it's Joe. Um, I, I didn't think that um, we needed material contribution um, to risk as a standard of causation in a case um, like we were talking about because that's, that's been invented when you don't know who is the cause. There could be a no, any number of defendants, only one or a few were the actual cause, but as a matter of policy, uh, the court um, imposes responsibility on everybody, even though they're act, they actually didn't cause the harm. We don't have any, there's no doubt that the, you know, the five major fossil fuel companies actually cause the harm. The question is the amount of the harm, not the causation of the harm. So I think we can meet the but for test. We don't need to invent anything too fancy. The only question is just, um, you know, so long as we get past a sort of a de minimis amount of, of harm, then the question is just how to apportion um, the liability to the, to, to the four or five, um, uh, you know, companies like their their cont their contribution. Uh, you know, as I I think there's a figure is, is they're responsible for six point five percent. That that doesn't sound that large, but it, it is large. And then maybe their individual contributions might be one or two percent or something. It's so some minimal. trial courts have said that, but what the Supreme Court of Canada has said over and over again is even if you have multiple defendants, but four is still the test. So you run it against each one. And if this loss would have happened, even in the absence of your defendant's misconduct, you fail on but for causation. That's what the Supremes have said. Now, maybe they'll change it, um, but I feel like we shouldn't get into a causation nerd conversation because I know we will lose people. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yes. Bring Corey into this because I see that she's got... I actually have, and maybe it's an offline conversation, but I think there's another way of getting around causation. So... Um, and but for, again, for causation nerds, we have but for in some states and we have substantial factor in others. And substantial factor means something different in every single state. <laughs> Just to keep state. you on your toes. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, I think there's a way around it because we have to keep remembering that the, the tortious conduct is the deceptive acts. It's mm -hmm. not the act of releasing or selling the product. It is the deception. And so if you think about it that way, Think about causation in terms of what if they hadn't deceived. Uh -huh. so. Awesome. <laughs> to be continued. Joe, uh, if I could, there's a question or two about LaRose. And you haven't given your take on the justiciability point. There's a, there's a question or two about um, is justiciability tied to the way we pleaded the case with respect to this kind of network, this constellation of laws? Is that, is that, is that part of the problem here? And how do we, on appeal, how do we deal with that? Well, the judge thought that um, uh, taking on sort of a constellation of, of federal laws and executive acts and administrative decisions was, was too broad. It, it raises uh, the justiciability problem. But as I said to the court, you know, uh, the, the, the very nature of climate change is that it's, uh, it, it, it is, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's cumulative. It's about cumulative um, uh, emissions over the course of a long period of time, which has impacts way into the future. 
And I said, you know, if we were to refine our case to specific provincial, or rather specific, um, specific federal laws or whatnot, um, we would be told that, you know, that's not enough. Uh, climate change is, in a, is, is I, I said to the court, is in the nature of sort of death by a thousand cuts. Um, if we tried to co go after any particular cut, we would lose. We've already, we've already demonstrated that, that that strategy isn't working, hasn't worked. And so we went after the thousand cuts. But, you know, the court kept thinking that we were um, trying to challenge the policy rationale under any particular kind of government law or executive act or administrative decision. We weren't doing that. Our case was really a matter of math and science. And I love what Linda said about, you know, the, the um, courts seem to be really comfortable with a lot of sort of very sort of, you know, controversial kind of cases, many of which I've been involved in, but they seem to really be afraid of science. And, 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 and but our case was math and science. The math part of the case was just count up all the GHG emissions that all these government laws and executive decisions and administrative decisions cause. Don't go behind, don't, don't, don't go behind them. Don't question the policy behind them. Just count up the emissions, that's math. And then the science comes in in, in, in terms of saying um, that these emissions are responsible for destabilizing the climate. What's a stable climate? We'll ask the scientists, they'll solve the problem. I didn't see any policy really in our, in our case. I didn't see anything non-justiciable about our case. And that's what I'm hoping I'm gonna to demonstrate to the Court of Appeal. A question that kind of segues from that and also from what Linda was saying about judicial education. Maybe I'll just kind of throw it out there as a, a sort of a cluster a question. Um, how do we, and what progress are we making in terms of educating judges about the science? Uh, Corey, have you seen, uh, you've been in front of the courts for a while on these cases. Is their literacy, their comfort level changing or every time is it just, do you have to start over again? And then for, the, for all of you, I guess, um, is, is judicial education that's uh, going to always have to happen in the courtroom? Are there other ways to do it? How, and, w and what are the essentials um, in terms of kind of moving forward on that front? Or, or do we have to wait for people to retire? <laughs> yeah. um, I would just say in the, in the U.S., one thing that we've said from the beginning is that as much as the industry wants delay, delay in some ways has worked to our advantage because public sentiment on climate change is radically changing every year. People see it's real and see it's caused by human conduct. And that trickles down, I mean, that affects judges too. They live in the, in the world. Um, in terms of the science, we haven't gotten to the science yet. <laughs> We're still, you know, fighting procedural battles. Um, and I do think there's a, a, an education function, but those two excerpts of cases that I, that I had in my PowerPoint, where the judges have read our pleadings and have seen the extent of the deception campaign those were, you know, we've had Republican judges and Democratic judges, and we haven't lost yet on that. And they are all just shocked. So we have to educate them, um, but it's happening. Even, even the Juliana decision in the Ninth Circuit shows that, you know, the judges, uh, they, read, they read the affidavits, they get the science, they don't have any reason to doubt the science. Right. So this it's in, it, it, there is headway being made, I guess. I'm not sure we're making the same kind of headway here, though. Um, how, Linda, have you ever done any work on this front, or is you just throwing that out there? I have done, yes, I've done some judicial education. Um, but you know what's interesting is I've suggested to the NJI that I should do more judicial education, and the answer that came back to me was they hear so few environmental claims that they're not really that interested. You know, most of what they hear is criminal law and family law, and that's what they want in judicial education. So, yeah, you know, it's just an interesting thing because it's really an argument in many ways for a specialized environment court because, you know, your judge could have dropped science in grade nine. And what I tell my talks of tort students is that it's so crucially important to learn to convey the science in an accessible manner because if it gets complicated, in my view, the side that has a comprehensible story wins. Not the truth, but the side that can be understood by the judge wins. 
And you really have to accept that you may be making submissions to somebody who has a very, very basic level of, of scientific literacy. But I mean, it was, it was very interesting to see the carbon pricing arguments um, at the Supreme Court of Canada, just to hear them even engaging with these concepts, I found quite inspiring. It's a good sign. There's a question, and again, all three of you may have thoughts on this. Um, these kind of cases are very resource intensive, especially in terms of, of kind of bringing forward the science, uh, uh, having experts available to f swear the affidavits, uh, to put it forward in a credible way. Um, what kinds of teams have you kind of assembled to do your work, Corey, on all these cases? I suppose there's some efficiencies because you're doing so many of them. And then to, and to, to Linda and, and, and to uh, Joe, as these cases go forward, will they look like other cases that you've litigated or been involved in? Or, or, or will the team kind of be something new, a, a kind of an assemblage that is different from other kinds of litigation teams that you've worked with? I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of issues that require expert testimony in these cases. Again, we are um, some, some distance from getting to put on our expert testimony. We are working with a lot of scientists in academia who've been very generous um, with their time, but we're prepared to meet the, the challenge. And we wouldn't be in the litigation if we couldn't do that. You know, from my perspective, um, it's just, this is not a, an unusual approach at all. I mean, you know, my, my area of expertise is doing a lot of charter litigation, which re necessarily requires uh, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. So, um, so I'm very comfortable with it and, and that's the way we should be proceeding. Yeah. yeah. I think courts can handle the science. When you look at the complexity of what they deal with in med mal, it can be very difficult, um, but they manage it. And I think at this stage in the evolution of climate science, they can manage it. I do see a comment from Andrew Gage saying, do I really mean climate adaptation when I'm talking about a focus of, of municipal damages? And yes, that's right. I think I said mitigation because some of that adaptation actually involves changing your microclimate so for example, these massive tree planting campaigns that can really buffer against extreme heat events. But yes, that's right. That's what I was talking about. Thank you, Andrew. You know, we thought we had the right judge with Justice Manson because his, his um, past was as an intellectual property lawyer. And it doesn't get any more complicated than you know, litigating patents and all, all that that entails. So I was trying to sort of play into that part of his experience and saying, you know, don't be afraid of science. Um, but anyway, he was, <laughs> no, maybe he wasn't, but anyway. <laughs> well, I note the time. I think we've covered off most of the questions and, 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 uh, not just, uh, kind of directly through this Q and A, but also off offline through chat and so on. Um, there was interest in learning more about, uh, the Dwell Masher, Olzinski article, uh, so we need to get a site for that. We should put that out there because I agree with you, Linda. That's a masterful piece of work and very interesting. Andrew, uh, I think, has sent that out. Okay. The SSR on yeah, as well as to W. Sela's take and you know the Peter Tabin's private member bill that was. All right. Good. Well, this has been an, uh, a great start to the to the webinar series, and I, I hope that. Uh, Set. They've stuck with us for hours, and uh, that's amazing. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, grow. Uh, oh boy, my internet's getting unstable there. Um, I'm just gonna. There we go. Um, I just wanted to uh, to thank the organizers, thank our panelists uh, for a great session, and uh, hopefully, um, unless uh, Andrew or another organizer has any parting thoughts. I think we will wind this up and hopefully get back together with you guys uh, 
on Monday. I think that's, or is Monday the next one? I believe so, right, Andrew? Monday's the next one. And I, all I want to say is thank you so much to all four of you for uh, providing such insightful and interesting commentary. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.